First of all, we want to welcome everyone back to the Museum's Night Conference Center for the Power Shift Summit. I'm Kathy Trost. I oversee our exhibits and programs here, and I also was a reporter myself for 25 years. Today's conversation is really going to focus on the reporters behind the power shift and the reporting behind the power shift. We're going to talk about reporters represented here who broke some of the biggest stories about sexual harassment and misconduct in the media industry and the courageous people who stepped up to tell their personal stories, sometimes at great personal cost. Um, I think that one thing that we have to say is that this much of this wouldn't have happened without the reporting. I think it's fair to say that without the power of the press and the courageous people who did step forward to tell their stories, this Me Too moment, this cultural reckoning, all these things that we're calling this time probably wouldn't have happened with quite the ferocity and the impact it did. And I also want to say in this conversation today, which we're going to push rapidly back out to you because we know how much um, interest there is in the room, that we're not um, relitigating, we're not autopsying these stories, and we're not assessing the accusers. We really want to come up with sort of what do we learn from this process, what's important to us all as we go forward. So joining us today are Amy Britton and Paul Farhi of The Washington Post, Oliver Darcy of CNN, and Lara Satrakian, Satrak, I'm so sorry, Lara. Got it, you got Satrakian, it. <laughs> the CEO and editor of News Deeply, and a co-founder of Press Forward, which we know from in meeting some of the women before, is a new group established by women journalists and others whose own experiences with harassment and assault sparked a mission to work for change. And so I'm going to start the conversation uh, with Oliver and Paul, because you did some uh, powerful reporting about journalist Mark Halperin uh, in October of last year. Tell us, let's start with you, Oliver, because you broke a story last October about five women who shared their stories anonymously, charging Halpern with sexually harassing them while he was in a powerful position at ABC News. Um, Lara was one of your anonymous sources, and we're going to talk a little bit about how that transitioned from you being anonymous to going on the record. But why don't we start first with uh, you, Oliver, telling us a little bit about the process of reporting that story. Sure. Uh, it started off uh, when I got a tip from um, someone. Uh, the Harvey Weinstein story had just broken, mm -hmm. and someone had tipped me and said, do you want to know the Harvey Weinstein of the journalism ministry? And I was, you know, obviously intrigued. So I said yes, and uh, that person told me that you should look into Mark Halperin. And so I, I didn't really have any specifics or anywhere to go, but I started digging, and I think I was looking for a couple weeks, um, and I had I told my editor that I had heard a lot of secondhand rumors about Halperin, and uh, I'm sure you heard the same thing. I, I had actually, before the tip though, never, never known about this, but I got the tip and I started digging, and I heard a lot of rumors. It was mostly secondhand. And I told my editor at one point, like, you know, I, I'm only hearing secondhand things. And he's like, well, keep, keep trying, uh, at least give it another day or two. So I think it was like a Friday, and I made contact with someone who had firsthand knowledge, direct knowledge of it. And from there, I told my editor, I think we have a store here, and kept pursuing it until we were able to break it on, I think, what was it, October 26th, that um, five women had gone background and, and mm -hmm. said that he had sexually harassed them. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, felt Assault, yeah. Assaulted. And these are important words uh, that we're all learning words that, that are important to speak out loud. Um, and Laura, let's go to you first because you did choose originally not to tell your story with your name attached. You later chose to tell your story with your name attached. What was at risk for you? And we can talk about this later with both of you in terms of building trust with reporters from the other side. What was at risk for you and what changed your mind? I was very concerned about my family, and they had forbidden me from sharing my name publicly. I think the generational shift really applies a lot within family structures as well. Mm -hmm. So there were mindsets in the elder generation that were very hard to press up against. And um, I, I can't believe, as a person who talks for a living, how different I feel talking about this. It's incredible. Um, the when Oliver reached out, I had never expected we'd be able to reckon with what had happened. Mm -hmm. Twelve years of, if not knowing it was okay, knowing that it was accepted. It was accepted, therefore it was acceptable. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And so uh, among these five women, I didn't know who the other four were. Mm -hmm. uh, all I knew was uh, it, that none of us were comfortable coming out. And I was hoping the story would run after we took all this energy <laughs> to share it. I was grateful when Oliver's editors made that decision. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the, over, the, over the next day, some of the women did start to come out by name. Mm -hmm. And I was actually, it was a lot of soul searching around what we do for a living. Mm -hmm. We ask people to do this, to come out with their names, to whistleblow, mm -hmm. to be honest. Mm -hmm. And how, how dare we not do the same for the greater good and the good of our profession. Mm -hmm. I also felt a bit as though I was a reporter embedded on the inside of an issue <laughs> because I couldn't turn off that part of my brain. And so observational journalism started happening. Mm -hmm. I, I was able to write an op-ed for the Washington Post where I felt very comfortable mm -hmm. telling my story in its completion around where the industry itself mm -hmm. needs to think hard about how we operate. And part of what prompted that and the decision to come forward, it's hard not to go long when you ask about <laughs> these things. Sure. Is the, thank you. Is, um, all of the women who did come out by name, none of them still work for mainstream news organizations. I run my own. And what that meant, clearly, was that we were afraid of our own industry. What we imagined, all of us, future job interviews sitting in front of someone who didn't treat this as a neutral to positive fact of our history, but that it would be certainly a negative. And so part of the power shift, when we talk about a power shift, is an understanding whether people in this room and others like them are going to be the ones sitting across the table. And if there are enough people who make us feel as though this is going to be a stain on our record for having come forward, mm -hmm. that it's a career-limiting move, mm -hmm. then that creates a lot of pressure that continues to suppress voices of women in these newsrooms right now. And the way I know that is, again, once we did come forward, they started channeling things to us and saying things like, go to management. He was management or the intern comment, mm -hmm. and other such horrific things. And I'm not at liberty to share because they're not my stories. But what hasn't been shared about Mark Halpern is far worse than what has been shared. Mm -hmm. Well, just to continue in the, before we go to Paul, tell us a little bit more about is it hard to lose control when you're telling your story to a reporter and you're essentially giving up your story to them? Yeah. And what's that process? And I, how do we yeah. learn from that? I did trust Oliver, and I had great respect for Paul's pieces when they came out. There were some recent editorial decisions I didn't fully agree with. It's, you know, you do want to share mm -hmm. with context in a situation like mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. So I didn't feel comfortable coming forward, but for the fact that I could benefit, which most women can't, from a page in the Washington Post. Mm -hmm. um, but I should also say the journalist in me is picking up. Part of the reason I know I feel like a correspondent within this story is... Uh, a lot of story ideas coming up, including transitional justice. Mm. And I'm looking actually at post-conflict environments where I encounter transitional justice. Mm -hmm. What is going to be fair? What is going to be the process? If it goes too fast and women victims feel slighted, as many have by the Glenn Thrush case, mm -hmm. that what happened with Glenn Thrush became the worst, has been, one from the start, was the worst nightmare of every woman who was victimized by Mark Halpern. That there would be a quick comeback, and anyone who was his ally would take vengeance, or that the clout would remain. Or th there was real vocalized concern about retaliation from people who are loyal to, to folks mm -hmm. who've done terrible things. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Let's come back to that, but let's talk, let's continue this this evolution, because it was a bit of an evolution, and, and, and two uh, organizations, I, would you say you were competing against each other at that point on the story? Yeah. And Paul, pick it up from here. Well, I mean, uh, I'll, I, Oliver and I were actually reporting the story at the same time. I don't know who started first, but you could hear the footsteps um, when you'd go to a source, and they'd say, you know, I just talked to this reporter. And, of course, as a reporter, that makes you crazy because you want to get your story <laughs> in the paper and not be beaten. Um, as it turned out, we were beaten. Not that anybody cares, but uh, Oliver's story uh, appeared, I think, on Wednesday night. And frankly, I was shocked when I saw this story because it contained, I think, four or five anonymous uh, sources saying that these things were the case. Now, uh, I had about four anonymous people, and I didn't think that was good enough. But what Oliver's story had, most importantly, was this admission from Mark Halperin that, yes, I've done some things that, you know, I'm not proud of, 
effectively, you know, reinforcing everything that he had reported in the story. The only thing I added the, the next day was I got an on-the-record person to, to come forward. I, I never talked to Lara, um, but um, I, another person uh, added her voice to it. So it, it kind of reinforced what Oliver had already reported. Um, you know, in my experience in reporting this, and Amy can talk about this too, is none of these anonymous accusations are ever wrong. Uh, they always check out one way or the other. There's always someone that the person talked with. There's some HR paper trail. There's always a way in which these things are not crazy. And so once you hear about one of these, you know you're on to something. Well, let's stick on the topic of anonymous sources for a minute because we're in a fraught time culturally um, in this country about the use of anonymous sources and trust in media. These are critical, though, to, I assume, to the reporting of some of these really sensitive stories. Yep. How do you weigh these decisions? How do your editors push you? Let's talk about that a little bit, and then we'll, and, and we'll bring Amy well, in. Well, I, I just want to say that once you, uh, any news organization reports that someone is a sexual harasser, you've destroyed this person, especially in this climate. They will never work in media again. They may never work again. So you really are, as a news organization, uh, putting your neck out, way out, in, in a way that you'd better be right about. And so the whole anonymous source thing does play into this because uh, editors are going to say, well, listen, we're going to destroy this guy based on the say-so of people that none of our readers can possibly know. You better get it on the record. Uh, but as I said, in, in Oliver's case, in his story, he had Mark Halpern basically fessing up. And once you have that, I think you you know, your anonymous sources are less uh, dangerous in some sense. And um, I think us having Halpern's statements uh, on right. where he, he, like, he said, fessed up, sort of, and he, um, he said he's taking a leave. I think that, at that point, that was news. So, I mean, he was taking a leave based on um, what these people had told us. And so we had to run the story at that point because, I mean, that, that's that's objectively news. Right. But, but I can't think of one of these many, many sexual harassment stories in which the news organization was wrong, even based on the anonymous sources. We're going to hit one of those and it's going to be, you know, a bad libel suit um, that that news organization is going to have to take. But so far in this new world, uh, there hasn't been one that I can remember that has been, been inaccurate or wrong. Yeah. It's also important sure. too, uh, as you said, Paul, there, there are often cases a paper trail or some sort of way to corroborate the story. So each of the our, uh, each of the people that we use anonymously, we had heavily vetted them, maybe more than everyone knows, uh, and uh, made sure that you know they were where they said they were, employed by who they said they were employed right. by, doing the job they said they were doing. Um, and we talked to their friends or someone that confided in at some point and made sure the stories lined up. So we did everything we could to make sure that these stories, while anonymously told initially, um, were were solid and, and and true. Amy, you and Arin Carmen, who I think is in the room, if she here's Arin over here, you broke the story for the Washington Post about Charlie Rose, a journalistic icon, um, his own show on PBS, also worked with CBS and 60 Minutes. Um, you revealed some pretty shocking stories that other people had talked about but never got into print. You reported the story in 17 days, as I understand it. The most challenging process, I think, was to get people to go on the record, which you wanted to do. So talk about that process of building trust while working in a competitive environment. Absolutely. So um, Aren uh, Carmone, my brilliant co-reporter on this story, came to the Washington Post newsroom on November 3rd um, as a, a freelancer and signed a contract to you know, join with me to pursue the reporting uh, of this investigation. And it was the most rapid pace investigation that I certainly have ever been a part of. Um, we began on November 3rd. The story was published on November 20th. So we did our work, uh, our reporting, our writing, our editing in 17 days, all while in the midst of an incredibly competitive environment. Uh, we were aware of six other outlets who were pursuing 
the story at the same time. Um, I think, Paul, you mentioned the footsteps that you hear. That's the worst part <laughs> of a reporting process like this, although um, you could argue that competition is good for our industry, and, and I think it has been good in revealing a lot of these stories. Um, Arin first came across uh, some of these allegations in the year 2010. So this predated the, pre the Me Too movement. It predated the Harvey Weinstein allegations. She was working for uh, Jezebel. Uh, when she first heard about some of these allegations and worked diligently but was unable to get people to go on the record back then, uh, she decided to try to go back to some of her original reporting uh, in the wake of the Harvey Weinstein reports. And when she found that people were more receptive to perhaps considering the, uh, the possibility of speaking out this time, she brought the story uh, and the pitch to the Washington Post. And we joined together. We were complete strangers before November 3rd, and uh, now I count her among my closest confidants and friends and colleagues. Um, we've shared a lot <laughs> in, in the past couple of months, as you would imagine. Uh, for us, the key part of this story, I think, was going back um, in the beginning to the original people who were kind of the source of some of those allegations that she had heard about in 2010, and then broadening the circle to try to find new people. We had eight women um, in our story. Originally, none of them were willing to go on the record. Uh, we were not willing to go forward with the story with anonymous sources. It was absolutely essential to have people on the record. And I think that we all realize that that's um, inherently kind of an unfair process, right, for the burden of proof to be on these women to step forward to have their names in Google searches, you know, for the rest of their lives um, attached to these allegations. That's a process that um, it's not necessarily fair to someone who has been victimized, but it is necessary in a story like this to put forward uh, the highest quality piece of journalism that we can. And that's what we needed to do. The story had to be uh, bulletproof in, us, in order for us to go forward with it. So when it comes to building trust with these women, um, we did it kind of in a shoe leather journalism way. These were in-person meetings that happened um, over the course of several weeks. You know, there were early morning phone calls with uh, one of our sources who was on the record, uh, Rhea Bravo. She lived in Europe. Every morning we would talk um, at about 7.30 a.m. <laughs> we would talk for an hour. Uh, she was off the record eventually, then was moving to background in about three days before the story's publication, decided to go on the record with the story. Uh, these were relationships that developed over time, relationships of trust. And one thing that um, I think we repeatedly said is that they were in control of the decision the entire time. You know, it was ultimately their decision. Um, as you mentioned, Laura, this is something that families can get involved with. Um, a lot of them were bringing in their family members, like in, in the discussions, to try to decide if it was worth it to go on the record, what the risk would be, what the um, outcome would be in making that decision. Um, ultimately, it, it was a decision that was extremely difficult. And although a lot of people have said that it is, I guess, easier to go on the record now in, in the post-Harvey Weinstein world that we're living in, um, I don't think you can say that it's ever easy to make a decision like this. I mean, it was gut-wrenching to listen to these women as they were debating the merits of either staying anonymous or going on the record. And we just tried to be good listeners and, and hear them out for everything that they were thinking and experiencing during these 17 days. It was extremely difficult for all of us um, as a collective group, as the reporters, as the sources. Um, we tried to be as transparent as possible in the reporting process and let them, knew, let them know where we stood at all times and what we needed and what the bar was t for publication. Um, at the same time, as, as I mentioned, there was extreme competitive pressure. But we told these women we are not going to rush this. You cannot rush a story like this. Just because there was competition, we were not going to put something in the paper that would leave anyone vulnerable. Um, it had to be solid across the board. And I'm just going to go back to Laura for a second before we go out to you. So if you have questions, would you tell our co-navigators if they're not eating <laughs> uh, to please uh, look toward you when, when we come back out? Um, Laura, you were a, a pretty young reporter back in 2006, <laughs> I think, when you had these traumatic experiences with Hopper, and you did not speak out at that time because of your fear of he was a powerful man with a lot of authority in your industry. Uh, you were afraid. What? can you talk about now that will help young women today to have the confidence to speak up and speak out? So I told people at ABC mm -hmm. I didn't file a direct report with HR. Mm -hmm. And that's what Oliver was able to go back and verify. Mm -hmm. And so my advice is to talk to someone. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> if I may squeeze in one other observation. Please do. 
this has underscored you know, my respect for all those who've left our profession. Mm -hmm. The Press Forward group left news largely under the pressure of these dynamics. They're now lawyers, management consultants, very well suited to design an initiative for system level change for our, to our great credit. But they, if not for them right now, it would be very difficult to know what had been going on then. And again, for better or worse, we've sort of, be, and not to say that we're somehow speaking on behalf of so many people, but we have become, for some of our colleagues, a place to go and share when they don't feel like they can. And so this conversation and the role of former journalists or journalists formerly at these places has to be given its due. Mm -hmm. Is there any uh, questions now or comments for over here? Can, uh, can we get a mic over to the far right? Anybody, can I just add one, uh, please do one, while we're waiting. Uh, one comment. Um, we would not be sitting here and you would not be sitting here today if it was not for the New York Times and the Correct. New Yorker. Uh, on October 5th, uh, Jody Cantor and Megan Toohey uh, wrote the first story about Harvey Weinstein. Ronan Farrow uh, in The New Yorker about four or five days later. Um, that broke the dam. Uh, th this has changed the world, and uh, I just feel like I am a minor league player compared to what those guys did. We did invite uh, New York Times reporters today who, could, who couldn't be here, but you're right. There's this absolute phenomenon called the Weinstein effect, I think, by some and others, but that did create a kind of opening, if you agree, yep. for what followed. And, and that's important to talk about why now and, and not then. A question over here? Great. This is Eleanor McManus from Press Forward. So, um, I'm Eleanor, I uh, went on the record with um, Oliver right after the story broke. Um, I, read the, I saw the story at like 7.07 break at, on CNN, and I emailed Brian Stelter right away because I knew him. I uh, spent my 10 years of my career at CNN um, as a producer with Larry King, so I knew a lot of folks at CNN. And I did not hesitate to go on the record because I knew if I went on the record that other people would come out. And then Laura was, it came out, Emily Miller, who's here with me, was able to come out. And, you know, we all decided to come out because it was important to tell to have other women come out there because of what happened to us. We were one, We had Mark Halpern, um, we were part of the group of, with Mark Halpern, and we were able to reach out to other folks. And it's, the problem is, as we discussed earlier, is that there's so many young women who are in their 20s, who are interns, who can't come out and who are afraid. And they are afraid because of the retaliation. I mean, this is all about power. And this happened to all of us because it's about power. And I think, actually, what I'm really thankful is for people like Paul, for people like Oliver, who really, were able to report this. When I saw the CNN story that had was able to report this without anyone on the record, with all anonymous sources, in my time at CNN, which is over 10 years, they never did this stuff with anonymous sources. So I'm thankful that you were able to do it because when I saw that story, I reached out right away and I decided to go public right away. And I thank you so much for that. And this is for all those other, I did it because I wanted other people to come out. And for all the young women, all these women in their 20s, all these interns, because they need to know that we, there's a voice for them, and I think going forward, what we want to do is arm them with what they can do going forward when this happens to them. We can. There's only so much we can do with to the companies and corporations and having men stop. But I think as we decided, as we said, we need to aim these young women and what what resources they can do when this happens to them, what they should do, so this won't happen again. And thank you. So. Just to give that a visceral, visual context as well. It's almost, it's really embarrassing. It's one of the more embarrassing things I can say about this. But when Ella came forward, I literally went to my parents and said, look, she did it. And then I'm like, look, she did it. I had to be number three for them to feel comfortable. It was that poignant. And did they become comfortable? No. And that was fine. Can I tell you another thing? Women in my family, what, when I told them I was going to do it, poured out stories of their own. And they came, they were refugees in America. They came from a war zone context, telling me about this happening to them in the middle of the Lebanese Civil War. And I had never known. And then when they were done, I thought I was home free. And they were like, no. <laughs> I was like, so, okay, so I'm going to print this. No. <laughs> yeah. So complex. But how do we turn this, and here's a question over here, into a discussion about how this becomes, um, it feeds into our systemic conversation this afternoon. How do we embed this uh, among our leaders that we can deal with this at a level where maybe it doesn't go to the press first, or when it does, how to, how to deal with it? Go ahead. 
I don't have the answer to that, <laughs> but I will think about it. Um, I did want to um, make a comment, and I'm going to do something that I very rarely do, which is assume the mic on behalf of women of color in media. First time, and hopefully only time I have to do this. Um, but there is a very real, very consequential perception that when white women ascend the ranks of power, to us it makes no difference. There's a very real and very material perception that complaining about harassment, complaining about discrimination to a qualified, smart, powerful white woman is the same as doing it to a white man. So we have to really talk about intersectionality because it matters in the reporting, but it really, really matters in the context of the environments in which women like me have to work. And so what I wanted to ask the panel was about the women around these men. There are always women around these men, and they're not always assistants. Sometimes they're the executive producers. Sometimes they're the showrunner. Sometimes they're the directors. So I want to know, did you talk to those women, and what did they have to say? Because I also think that we should dispense with the naive notion that just having a woman in power solves the problem. I think Amy's got the best perspective on that. Very good question, thank you. Um, I can just speak to the Charlie Rose story. Those of you who read it may have remembered that there is a woman who has been by his side uh, for more than 20 years on his show. Um, her name is Yvette Vega, longtime executive producer of the show. Um, and one of the things that we heard from multiple women who we interviewed is that uh, they felt initially a sense of reassurance, you know, that Charlie had such a strong, powerful woman by his side. This felt like kind of a safe environment. And then when uh, alarming things started to happen, when the sexual harassment began, um, they felt in a way betrayed by the fact that uh, that there was no one to turn to or no one to report this to. Some of them did say that they told her and confided in her, and they were kind of brushed aside and told, well, that's just Charlie being Charlie. That's just how he is. Uh, she did issue a statement to us uh, hours before publication. In my opinion, it was kind of a jaw-dropping statement. Uh, when I got it, I, I kind of had to take a minute to absorb it. Um, the, the gist of the statement was that... Um, I am so deeply sorry I have failed. Um, I did not stand up for these women, you know, throughout the years. I have never spoken to her um, after that. Uh, unfortunately, I, I've requested uh, several interviews with her and she has not responded. I'm hopeful one day that, that perhaps we could sit down and I could try to understand that dynamic and how it develops uh, throughout the years because I think that's one aspect of all of these stories that, that need further reporting, right? It's not just one person. It's a system, and we need to look at who's around these individuals and um, how the system kind of enables this type of behavior to persist. On, on that note, too, I had spoken to someone um, who was um, working with Mark Halperin at the time, and, and it was a woman as well, and she had told me, I want to get the attribution wrong, but she was, was working with him for a while, and she had told me that uh, she felt like a coward for not doing anything and that she had failed, and, and that's something that's sticking with her for a while. Um, so I, I do think there is definitely a sense of looking back for some of these people who knew about the allegations or at least aware of them, uh, that they did fail women and that that's something that they regret and they have to live with. And, and I'll give a shout out to Jill Abramson. Um, I wrote a story about Mike Oreskes at NPR and I had two people complaining anonymously. Um, there was enough of a paper trail to know that the story was uh, real. But the only on-the-record person was Jill Abramson, who had been the deputy Washington bureau chief at the New York Times while Mike Oreskes was the bureau chief. And she admitted that she had not done enough to protect some of the younger women uh, in the bureau when Mike um, allegedly had, uh, you know, uh, hit on them or preyed upon them. And um, she really helped make that story. So, I mean, there are, you know, women who have admitted just as you said, that they didn't actually do what they should have done. From our perspective, in that era of the early 2000s, well, really 98 to mid 2000s, uh, our perception was that we, I, we knew slash believed that certain executives very close to him would not be wise to go to. And so we still don't know what they knew at the time, 
but we did not, we, we were pretty gosh darn sure that it would be, one woman called it career suicide, to go to the women who were very close to him. And they had very influential positions over who did what and who got which opportunities. Um, but before we go back out into the audience, so let's talk a little bit about the Oreski story, um, Paul. Just tell us what you learned from that, or tell us a little bit about that process. Well, I thought it was sort of a garden variety uh, harassment story. Um, there, I mean, seriously, when you when you go back over this, there there are these things just fall into rather cliched patterns. Um, there had been two uh, complainants uh, about uh, Mike at NPR during the time uh, he was there. Um, NPR basically shrugged. Um, I don't want to go too far, but, but they basically said, well, we'll look into it and we'll think about it. But they didn't do anything about it. And um, it turns out after that story uh, I, I wrote um, that a third person came forward and then I guess subsequently other people have come forward. Um, but, uh, you know, they were anonymous. These things actually, the things that they described, it happened to them back in like 1998, 1999. And when Mike had was hired by NPR, they went to NPR effectively over a course of months and said, um, these are things that happened to us while we were at, um, while he was at the New York Times. What are you going to do about it? And again, NPR basically didn't do anything about it. And um, so, you know, and they probably could have continued not to do anything about it, um, except that the climate has changed so much that they had to do something about it. Again, not wanting to relitigate these stories, but I yeah. think there was an assertion that there were things going on about it that weren't that weren't revealed at that point. But let's don't. Well, what was going on? I mean, go, go there. They had looked. They had looked into it and had mm -hmm. done nothing. But the, the question is, what do you, what did, what's the lessons learned for other institutions that are dealing with these kinds of um, impacts in their own newsrooms? From, but there's from there's what a before thought. and there's an after. Right. I mean, we are now in the after phase. Mm -hmm. And now there is absolute instantaneous, um, you have to hit the panic button. Um, before, you could get away with not doing very much at all, or at least talking about it, um, and, you know, not firing somebody, um, uh, now we're in a different climate and, and it's a better climate. What does it mean to hit the panic button? Um, you got to address it immediately mm -hmm. up to and including firing the person. Mm -hmm. Where the pendulum lands depends on us. Mm -hmm. And I personally believe we need an industry-wide conversation about, mm -hmm. because again, if these move too fast or unilaterally, they'll not only, it'll be very harmful. Mm -hmm. And yet if there's only panic button thinking, that will be very harmful. Okay. Other... Hi, we have a few Go ahead. folks here, Indira from Pointer and Terry from ASNI. Hi, thank you so much for doing this. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Indira Lakshmanan from the Pointer Institute, and I really want to follow up on Sarah's question, which is specifically this problem of cultures, newsroom cultures that enable this to happen. And what we've seen so far is that certain individuals have fallen from grace. As you say, panic buttons have been hit. Certain individuals have been taken out. Not all, I might add. Not everyone who um, seems to be culpable of actions. But what about the executives who enabled this to happen? And in newsroom after newsroom, I talk to colleagues who say, oh, we all knew about him doing that. Management knows about that, and they've known about it for years, and they've said that's just X being X. You have to deal with it. You know, figure out a way to deal with it. And that, I think, is the real problem. That's what I hope we're here to sort of try to establish. What do we do in leadership, in newsroom management leadership? And I sort of open it up to all of you. What can be done to so that executives are accountable? I haven't seen one single executive falling from their position, just the individuals who did the violations. Amy, do you want to start with that? Yeah, I mean, I think as reporters, we need we need to do more on that front. I think that, you know, when someone topples from grace, there's kind of a, all right, let's move on. You know, who's the next harasser of the week? And these stories were all happening so rapidly over the last three months that we've, you know, had a moment to catch our breath a little bit as an industry. Um, and I think uh, I personally would love to see additional reporting, you know, about this, the system at NBC, um, the accountability. Uh, 
uh, the aftermath. Who exactly is leading, you know, these investigations? Uh, can an internal organization really look inside their own company and come out with a fair result? Um, do these results need to be released to the public? Is it better to hire an outside law firm to lead these types of investigations? Um, and I think that, uh, you know, we're doing more reporting on this front. Uh, I hope that other news organizations are as well. In, in many ways, the system stories are more challenging, I think, uh, than one individual. You know, you're, you're not just talking about one bad apple. You're trying to figure out who knew what, when they knew it, and where the layers of accountability and failure exist. Let, let me tell you about ABC. ABC, I think, has been the most arrogant about the Halperin situation. They basically said nothing, did no internal investigation that I know of, maybe Oliver does, um, and they effectively said this happened before we, the present management, were the present management, not our problem necessarily. <laughs> and I thought that was uh, a real you know, stiff arm to uh, the world. There was not a whole lot of transparency in that particular instance. Mm -hmm. And Oliver, what about this question of leadership stepping up to um, make the case for this being a panic button, transparent situation? I, I think it's a tricky question for a number of reasons, but mm -hmm. um, I, I think what we've seen, though, is when the system has failed, mm -hmm. uh, people have gone to the press, mm -hmm. uh, to reporters, and those reporters have uh, affected change. And I think mm -hmm. that's what happens a lot of times when the system fails. That's why journalists are there, for people to share their stories mm -hmm. and for us to get um, you know, the truth out to the public. And, and mm -hmm. often it's unfortunate that that has to be the case, but we see it in all sorts of industries, in government, when something in government fails, you know, um, people go to the press and, and share their stories. And in this case, in sexual, with sexual harassment, we've seen a lot of institutions uh, fail to address it properly over the years, and people are now going to the press, to different outlets, and, and sharing their stories with reporters, and reporters are tracking them down. This can't be it, we know that, but I know there are a lot of answers to that question in this room. Mm -hmm. We feel very strongly that we need to filter them into the short, medium, and long term, mm -hmm. and be smart about the blueprint, so we're likely going to do a six-month study looking at what the blueprint would be or could be. Press forward, we'll do it. And with whomever else would like to take part, because this is a, this takes some thought and some surveying of other industries, mm -hmm. in addition to not just the individual what went wrong, but what's the long-term fallout, and how is that shaped everything about the way our industry operates. I, I just want to also say that uh, I've covered the media for a while, well, actually for a long time, and um, media industries, media companies are no better at their own transparency than any other industry that I've covered. And, you know, the only difference between them is they're bigger hypocrites about their lack of transparency. Well, that's but that's, that's a point I'd like to bring up, which is turn this around. Um, there's been a lot of talk about cleaning our own house. What if you got a tip in your own newsroom? Yeah. Um, about uh, someone being accused. Uh, what, what, what's going to happen? Yeah, that's a tough one. Um, we, I have to say, we've had that discussion inside the Post, you uh -huh. know, for weeks and weeks. What happens? Um, I don't know is the answer. I bet you do. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? My own Just... transparency here. Yeah. <laughs> is what's your guess? Uh, what's your guess? At this well, point? I mean, it would obviously be managed. Let's just mm -hmm. say that editors would get involved, and we'd have to, you know. Mm -hmm. I guess the, the maybe the bottom line is we'd probably rather break our own news than have it broken. For, in Are front you of being us. proactive about this at all? I mean, I, I mean, I've we've not all you. Asked, we've all asked the institution, around. The institution. We, no, we've all look. We have 800 reporters, 700 reporters. Yeah. At the, what? You don't think that there might have been somebody at some point? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I yeah, mean, yeah. that that reality has occurred. But to there's us. no systemic kind of um, uh, looking at how we will react if this happens. There, it's just it's just a story. You're going to be you're going to be on it. Your suspicion is that you're going to be on that story, even if it's in your own house. I hope so. Yeah. Okay. And Oliver, how do you feel? Well, I, I think we saw David Falkenflik. He, yeah. he reported on it very correct. You know, straightforward, and it didn't seem like he. He, you know, I think he did great work when when it hit NPR. Um, I, I think you know we have reported. Um, Brian Stelter, my colleague, reported on um, uh, some issues at CNN with a senior producer who was who was let go. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, I think that sure, if there's definitely a, a story inside house, we're not going to shy away from it. We're going to cover it and make sure it's reported. Mm -hmm. um, I think it'd be more complicated, obviously, because it's in house and it's there's an HR department and and, and different things. But um, I don't think it's something we would shy away from. Absolutely. And I think 
our record shows that we haven't. More? Harry uh, Haight from ASNI. This builds on Indira's question a little bit. We all have processes. Everybody's got an HR department. But a lot of the people that we've talked about and a lot of the people that, you know, have been out in the news, these people came from other organizations. How does somebody pass an interview background when rumors have been going around? I, I mean, I understand the legalities that are involved here, but, but clearly these were uh, problems that followed from one place to another. And, you know, our jobs as editors are to keep our employees safe, to keep our news fresh and, and, and producing, to, to do a, a valid news report. And yet we're holding a lot of people accountable on how they hire people. And yet, to Paul's point, we don't seem to have that same accountability when we are hiring a lot of leadership. And that's just key to a success of not only an organization, but the kind of news that you're going to be producing in your community. Do you have um, an idea or have you heard in the course of your reporting organizations that are, are vetting their leadership better than others? Anyone? I, I'll, I'll just, I, this is just a guess. Um, you'd think in this climate, um, this question is there something bad in this person's background will be prominent in the vetting process. Uh, maybe people, maybe organizations didn't have awareness of this problem before. They probably should have, but they certainly can't plead innocence now. They, they really should be checking it and trying to figure out if there's something we're going to be blindsided by. Go ahead. Hi, Emily Miller. I'm now with Press Forward. Um, I came out um, about Mark Halperin. Um, I've not given the specifics. It's still, for me, too personal. And so, but I'm looking to the looking forward with this group, Press Forward, which came about, for those of you who have of just hearing about us, quite organically and beautifully, I think. Um, when I, I, and this is, goes to your question about moving forward, and I think that's what we're doing. When I, I just tweeted Me Too to Oliver's story and said, to be clear, I'm not one of the anonymous people. I'm another, I was a junior level ABC staffer who he attacked. Um, and then everybody else started coming out and I just wanted to talk to them because I just wanted support. I just wanted to talk to the other women. I started calling them and Ella, who you heard from earlier, and I got together a couple of days later and she said, we need to do something else. We need to go forward with this. We need to build something out of this and we need to do something good out of this. And it was so clear suddenly that there was, we're not gonna stop with just, we've been hurt so badly and this is hung over our heads. We're gonna move forward. And so that's why we created this organization and what we do is, and we've all come together and we just found each other through social media um, LinkedIn and Facebook and friends of friends. And we now have, um, is there 12 of us, Laura? There's 12 of us uh, in the leadership. We have about 20 total who are not in the leadership, but keep in touch closely. And we're bringing in advisors. And our goal is to make sure that newsrooms no longer ever have any sexual harassment or sexual assault ever. And this is all still so new, obviously. I mean, we've all talked about this. Paul knows, has talked about this too. Two months ago, I will tell you, two months ago, and I've been in the news business since I was 21, actually. Um, two months ago, I did not know that sexual harassment, at, sexual harassment was illegal. I thought it was some sort of workplace rule. Much less know that the sexual assault, which has happened to me several times in my career, sexual harassment has happened to me in every job I've had in my career, newspaper, several network TV stations, local TV, all of them. And I had no idea it was illegal. And so I think going forward, one of the most important things we can get across, if we can get it across today for young women in this business and of course in every business, is that this is not a workplace rule. Even though they stick you in that room and make you watch the video in the HR department, they never say this is against the law. They always say, well, this is what you should do. They don't say it's against the law because they don't want to get sued. It's against the law. If your boss starts talking to you like that, starts insinuating that you would have sex with him, starts saying to me, I had a boss, well, 
I'll just say, he knows who he is. And he said to me, and this is in recent years, it doesn't stop when you're young. Um, in recent years said he moved to an office. He asked me why he wanted, thought I moved offices. He moved to an all glass office. He said, because he likes watching me walk back and forth to my desk every day. This is recent years. So it doesn't stop. That's sexual harassment, but I didn't know it at the time. I didn't even know to go to HR. I just, you just learn to deal with it. And so I've learned to deal with it in my career. I've sucked it up. I've dealt with it. I keep moving forward. I keep going, <laughs> pressing forward. But what I want more than anything, and I think this is what we all want more than anything, and this is where we go from here in starting place, is that every woman who starts her career at 22 in any job, especially what we're talking about journalism, should understand what is legal, what is not legal, and what to say in the moment. When my boss said that to me recently, as an adult and a grown up who knows these things, I should have said, that's sexual harassment, and I should have said, that's offensive, because it was embarrassing in her, and embarrassing in shameful, quite frankly. And what Mark Halpern did to me, I thought I was the only one. I literally thought I'd done something wrong. I thought I'd been flirtatious. I thought, oh my gosh, what have I said? What did I do? How did I get myself in this mess? It didn't occur to me to go to HR because it, I thought I'd done something wrong and I thought I was the only one. So we have to get this somehow a training in, and I'd love to get it uh, online and into colleges. So before you start work, you know what to say when this happens to you, you know how to prevent it. We can get parents to give this to kids when they graduate school, graduate college. Here's a handbook on what's allowed and what's not allowed, and here's what to do if it happens. Yes, you're gonna have to go to HR. I'm sorry for the HR people in the room, but those of us who've gone to HR and have had no help from it, that's not going to be a permanent answer, but you do have to go to HR at one point. Well, and then, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, please. But I do think going forward, we are only two months into this. And so we, Press Forward, would love to get input from any of you who have ideas of concrete things that we can advocate for and we can push for to, get, to make these changes because the goal is never again are there anyone who says me too. I mean, that's our goal. Well, let's keep building on that, this idea of how do you build solutions to these issues. And you link, how do you, how do your stories link to the broader dynamics in the industry? Laura, you've said that the news industry is riddled with abusive habits um, uh, that we've normalized and internalized. And this speaks to a little bit of what you're talking about. Talk about that a little and how, in, in terms of how we go forward. There were a few points in that article I feel very strongly about. Mm -hmm. One is um, the degree to which women of substance who don't look a certain way and aren't in a certain age range seem mm -hmm. to disappear off the airwaves mm -hmm. and thus from the public conversation mm -hmm. when they have so much to give. Mm -hmm. Another, which I didn't put in the article, is a only half-joking wish to monitor for cleavage on public airwaves, at least the public airwaves, uh, and put up some sort of uh, campaign around that. Mm -hmm. I think them sending the message, I mean, cleavage on public airwaves, you don't see it in Canada, you don't see it in the UK. Um, this isn't one of those, but this is just to say, we weren't supposed to be that. The ideals this building stands for mm -hmm. doesn't have to do with that. It mm -hmm. doesn't have to do with physical perfection as the table stakes mm -hmm. for telling stories in our profession. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we have to look very closely at what that does to people's confidence. Mm -hmm. It is, I see it terrorizing women in their 20s in our profession. And then I see it terrorizing women in their 30s and 40s in this profession based on when they no longer get judged with the pass mm -hmm. to go forward. And that affects, again, not only mobility, but overall performance, mm -hmm. meritocracy, ideation, product development, mm -hmm. business model development. Mm -hmm. The women I've seen leave the profession or go quiet or have been pushed to go quiet had a lot of the answers to some of the bigger questions about the state of our industry. So I actually see this as a future of news conversation. And it's funny, intersectionality means a lot to me. Race means a lot to me on this front, um, and diversity does. But it's such, it means so much to me that even inter this is the same problem. It's, mm -hmm. it's, you, don't, you shouldn't even have to intersect them. This is a dynamic. It's about how we value individuals or reduce them and devalue individuals. Mm -hmm. Well, we're uh, looking for some other... Do Kathy, we have, we have Sharon Toomer here, who is NABJ's new executive director. Good afternoon, and thank you for a robust conversation. Um, there's so much to say about this, but I've narrowed it down. <laughs> and 
it picks up on some of the other commentary. But in all, I've worked in newsrooms, and I've also worked outside of the news business. And the act over here is the act over there. So this is uh, workplace wide, right? Um, and while some deal with sexual harassment, others deal with um, bullying, hostility, in a way that's almost a disdain for your presence. And I'm speaking mostly, um, uh, like Julika, I don't speak for all black and brown women, but it seems to be, uh, that's what we feel. That's what we get. And we do leave. It disrupts our careers. It disrupts our um, livelihoods. And but in all of these instances, these are known. These, the offender is a known entity, right? So they've been enabled, um, they've been protected, they've been promoted, they've been um, coddled, and so what that says to me is that one, um, the people who are most responsible, uh, leadership at the highest level of any organization, whether it's a board, whether it's executive leadership, have decided that this is what they're going to allow in their operation. And so to me, that's a sickly culture. That's a sickly system. And the tendency is to uh, protect your own, right? Your own system or, your, or an individual. I would like to see um, as a resolution where, uh, the highest level of any organization takes a serious step towards transformative change, not uh, reactionary change or, you know, catering to the moment. Uh, and the way you do that is not huddle ten people in the same from the same organization because that's just not. It's just you. You can't self-analyze and self-examine for transformative change. So I've heard a lot about. Uh, hiring a law firm. Well, you know, all no offense to Washington, because that's all that's here are lawyers, but uh, and journalists, but lawyers serve a purpose, but their purpose is not organizational change. And so if you're serious about transformative change, because that's what we're talking about, then you're going to hire those people, those organizations, those experts who can actually do that for you and weather that storm because transition and transformative change is very painful. Uh, so that's what I would like to see because I don't think it's going to change uh, even a little bit if that's not the heavy lift that these organizations are willing to do. And I'd like to give some credit to Sharon Waxman because before, uh, that's not a slight to those who broke this uh, Harvey Weinstein story, but she did try to tell the Harvey Weinstein story in 2010, and they wouldn't go with it. So, again, these are not um, very good secrets. We're a gossipy industry. I mean, <laughs> you know, we know the, the bad actors in any newsroom, but for whatever reason, um, they just keep getting promoted and moved up. That's really the extent. Okay. Kathy. Well, let's go back to the reporters to talk a little bit more about that. But what did you learn in your reporting that? Um, maybe you saw patterns of things in organizations, patterns of behavior that helps help us think about solutions moving forward. I mean, I don't know if any of you dealt with people who had non-disclosure agreements that you had to work around. Paul, you want to talk about that? Yeah, n none of the people I dealt with had non-disclosure agreements. Um, mm -hmm. That was the Weinstein case mostly, I think, mm -hmm. uh, which made the Weinstein story even more amazing when you thought about the 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 legal you know barriers and the thuggery that was protecting uh, Harvey Weinstein. Um, my the, hashtag thuggery. <laughs> my, my experience was a little more straightforward and uh, a little simpler. Um, there were people, there were victims, there were people who wanted to talk. Uh, the story is um, compelling. Um, that's what we're here for, and uh, it was. As I, as I said earlier, just really, a lot of these were just very garden variety. Um, mm -hmm. They have wrinkles, but um, nevertheless, they're, mm -hmm. they're, you know, they're people who've been screwed over by a system, mm -hmm. by an individual, but by a system as well. Amy, how about you in terms of seeing patterns of behaviors or organizational structures that contributed? Actually, um, speaking of patterns, Arun and I, um, in the reporting process, we realized that we were hearing 
so many of the same like behavioral patterns when it comes to Charlie Rose and how he was initially approaching some of these women. Like the first move would be putting, you know, a hand on their knee and then moving the hand up to the thigh and then gauging their reaction to that physical contact. Um, if they ignored it, typically he would um, progress in his levels of physical contact with them. Uh, so we, when we were talking to these women, we were hearing other stories, uh, groping a breast, um, uh, lewd phone calls. So at one point, we actually made a chart, a very sick chart, with all of the, um, the different categories of behavior. So there were columns, and then we had all of the women that we had interviewed with, and we were putting check marks in like the different levels of um, incidents that they had with him. And that was really important, I think. Did you want to add something? Oh, yeah, I mean, I, I was just going to say, one of the things that's different. Hold on. Hold on. Wait, wait, wait. Microphone <laughs> <laughs> coming. Um, Amy is more than ably representing on this panel, um, but in terms of patterns, one thing that's really interesting, um, listening to the individual from NABJ, sorry, I, didn't, I don't recall your name, is that being an asshole in the workplace is not illegal. Um, being racist, to, you know, is something that you have re legal recourse, uh, gender discrimination. Um, Farai, I think this is a point that you made really beautifully in the writing that you did after the, the takeaway um, incident, which is that the, the patterns that we saw, that sexual behavior that we, that those women told us about, happened also amid what one of them called emotional terrorism, right? So they said it wasn't just that there was sexual harassment. It was also that he would scream at me and he would tell me I'm, I'm so stupid and I would never have any job without him. I mean, I had never heard about Mark Halperin being a sexual harasser until very recently, but I had heard that he was an asshole. Right, so I think when we talk about newsroom culture, we're also we also need to think about the kinds who gets away with being difficult. Right, there's been really smart observations about uh, coddling the stars. One pat one thing that we really didn't put in our story because it's not you know it's not actionable, but we have to think about is that the kind of behavior that uh, people get away with because they are the star, and specifically often men get away with, specifically white men most of all. Um, Again, it, you know, one of the women who we spoke to who worked at the Charlie Rose show, actually after the piece came out, she said, uh, you know, men keep asking me about the sex stuff, and I just want to talk about the work stuff. <laughs> I want to talk about how hard it was for me to go to work because my boss was bullying me all the time, and the sexual harassment is part of it. But I think if we are thinking about culture, we're also thinking about what kind of behavior gets tolerated and by whom. Great point. <laughs> um, let's talk too about where it's going to go from here. What you're obviously you've reported heavily over the past six, seven months. Um, you probably have some stories in the works. I don't know if you'll tell us about them. Paul, you had some <laughs> stories that you said were fails uh, yes. that, that didn't pan out. You want to talk a little um, bit about that? Well, I, I pursued two stories um, uh, about harassment claims by uh, people you would all have heard of. And that, uh, first of all, I should say that the you of all have heard of is now kind of the standard for the way we report these things. Um, I heard of a third case in which it was a guy you'd never heard of. And my editor said, it's bad, but do we really want to report that to people who are going to say, who is this guy? I've never heard of him. So there is kind of a, a standard here. Um, in the case of the two that I want to say got away, it, I, I couldn't get somebody to talk on the record. I couldn't get somebody to talk on background. Um, some of it was just bullying, as Aaron said. Um, he was, he is a cr crummy boss, um, and there were some sexual elements to it. Anyway, it didn't. It just didn't add up to the way we now think of these stories and. Let's face it, we all do stories that fit certain kinds of templates and cliches and stereotypes, and this didn't fit the template and the cliches and the stereotypes. Yeah, but there must be some evolutionary thinking among all of you about where to go from here, and you were talking, Amy, about the systemic stories now are where we need to go, but they're harder to do. You want to talk about Absolutely. that? Absolutely. I mean, I, I tweeted this after the Charlie Rose story. I, minutes after that story was posted, I mean, my inbox was just flooded with 
women who had encountered him uh, decades apart, um, additional stories not only related to him but to, um, to networks, to people who worked around him. And, you know, we're still going through all of those and we're still reporting. Um, I think that uh, in the case of the Charlie Rose story, what was helpful in the reporting is that it was a very small universe. You know, his show on PBS was a very small staff. It was about 12 to 15 people at any given moment. When you're talking about um, holding a large network accountable uh, for perhaps a system of enablers in some cases, uh, that's a vast universe of reporting, you know? And, and these stories take time, they take resources, um, they take really sharp editors, dedicated reporters, and um, we're continuing our reporting, and like I hope to see more stories kind of in that similar realm in the future, because I think that's how this reporting evolves, right? We've had these flurry of stories about this one man after the other falling from prominence, but where do we go from here? Like, how did this happen? This mm -hmm. didn't just emerge overnight. Mm -hmm. um, this happened for years, and, and there's also a, a part of this that's like the tremendous loss of intellectual power in the industry from young women who quit journalism because they didn't feel like it was a safe place for them anymore. So while some you know, readers or commenters may be dismissive about the long-lasting impact of someone groping your thigh or you know, grabbing your butt, uh, for some of these women, it was the end. It was the end of their journalism careers. It was not a place that felt like a safe environment for them anymore. And um, that's been maddening to hear, heartbreaking. And for me, it just wants me to, it, it, drives me to pursue more stories related to those types of effects that I don't really think that we have fully explored yet. Oliver, are you still working on? Um, yeah, I, 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 like Paul has, and I think like most media reporters have, I've looked in a few stories and you know they haven't turned out. But I think what's interesting when you look at this is I think when we reported the Mark Halpern story, it took a full week and nine people and, and then others, at least a dozen people actually accusing it. nine people anonymously, I wanna say, or I get it wrong, but nine people spoke to CNN and then some other people came out on, on the record. And after that weekend, NBC finally cut ties. So it was about a, almost a full week later, I think. And with Charlie Rose, how long did it take for his show to be canceled or, or put on hold? It was very um, They quick. suspended him within about 30 minutes, I think. And then <laughs> um, uh, the next morning, uh, CBS announced that, that he had been fired. Um, right. So like the, I think the, the um, response rate from mm -hmm. management is, is, is much faster. Mark, uh, Lauer was fired, you know, pretty quickly, mm -hmm. and NBC's response, if you look at NBC's response, was much more apologetic than ABC's response to Mark Halperin. So I think that newsrooms are definitely grappling with how to handle this if it hits if it's home, mm -hmm. and they seem to be taking it a lot more seriously and mm -hmm. responding a lot more, um, a, a, a lot faster. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We've got about <laughs> 10 minutes to go, so let's try to get in some yeah. more people. Um, my name is Lynn Adrian. I uh, work at, uh, with the Newhouse School at Syracuse, but uh, the majority of my professional career has been here in Washington, D.C., and primarily uh, in, uh, middle management at ABC News before I went to uh, Newhouse. Uh, we're talking about uh, organizational patterns. We should be talking about industry patterns. Mm -hmm. This stuff has been going on forever. And one of the things I worry about now with my graduate students, who are primarily female, mm -hmm is they are not going to these big organizations with their first jobs. They're going to small newsrooms around the country. And we're not having conversations the way I think we need to with them about how they protect themselves in those environments. Uh, for those who are lucky enough to actually work with a cameraman, to be riding with a cameraman who's telling you about his marital, marital problems and how his wife doesn't give him enough sex. And, what, and um, you seem like such a nice girl or talking to you about how you dress. It occurred to me that when my students come to Washington to cover Congress in their capstone program, uh, and they're assigned to small market television stations around the country, we talk to them about everything, including about how to dress and how to fend off unwanted attention from, um, from members of Congress and from other uh, Washington power brokers. We don't have that conversation about their newsrooms. And that is one of the things that we're going to have to talk about on an individual level that we're talking about with uh, women supporting each other or people in general supporting each other. I spent my professional life in Washington, so I was able to have, I was able to have a crew. I was able to have a network of people because there are a lot of journalists here working in various environments. If you're in Abilene, Texas, that may not be the case. 
And we have to really talk about also how to deal with the people who are now coming into the business separate from what large organizations will do. I think that's going to be a very important part of our next conversation about systemic change and what newsroom leaders need to do in that, in that regard. I'd ask Lara a question now, and then we'll go back out, to say, what would you tell reporters at this point? What would you tell newsroom leaders gathered here about what needs to change, what companies need to so do? I came up with a campaign for the cleavage right. thing. Yeah. Hashtag news boobs. OK. <laughs> and so maybe we can get that going. I um, just don't think it's fair to the women. I mean, but people that, will hate me for it, but uh, again, uh, more systemically, more some the the kinds of really key, powerful pieces that need to be in place. I take that question very seriously and system systematically. Actually, I do think there are categories. We've come up with a few, mm -hmm. um, but these are this is pencil sketch. This is something that we all need to bring our expertise around. I mean that very seriously, also. But the uh, empowering, what would you tell empowering. Oh, to what would I tell for? Yeah, what, what, what should they be Look, looking I think out for now, right now? It's I, that that thing of t telling people, but I do think it's extremely important that we start empowering and connecting each other, mm -hmm. and that efforts that have been made, like the ones at Women's Media Center, don't remain marginal; that they become mainstream, so that the awareness is there, so the connectivity is there. People at ABC in my time didn't know that many people from NBC. We didn't compare notes, right? And so there wasn't a sense of transversal safety or connectivity and sharing. Mm -hmm. And so, honestly, the best advice is connect up mm -hmm. and across, mm -hmm. because that peer network, and then the women of substance who do care, all of whom are listed in the program here as participants, mm -hmm. are allies. I think that's very important. Mm -hmm. There's a little bit of infrastructure that has to be there for that advice to the reporter to be meaningful, so that from Abilene, when they email someone from here, they have an ally, and that's crucial. Mm -hmm. So empowering and connecting women is a huge pillar of this. And honestly, a lot of change will depend on political will from individual organizations. And then there will be a wedge of some organizations that do it better than others. And those will be the great places to work. Mm -hmm. And if anyone has any consideration for talent and retention, they'll notice which side of that they're on and hopefully follow up. Good point. Back um, to Sarah. Before we hear from Suzanne Reber from the Center for Investigative Reporting, I also just wanted to mention mm -hmm. when we talk about Me Too, we're talking about in this um, discussion reporting, um, we need to bring up the name Tarana Burke. Yeah. And um, and I think that also underscores when we're talking about reporting and coverage mm -hmm. that we're inclusive of all communities, that we give you know homage or we at least identify or heighten you know, who's behind these conversations. And I think, you know, the lack of diversity within newsrooms also begets some of the issues in terms of the story and how it's told. Mm -hmm. um, and Tirana, you know, right after the Me Too hashtag, you know, hit the airwaves from Melissa Milano, it was 12 to 48 hours before um, many news organizations were at least attributing um, to Tirana. So I just wanted to bring that up, that we can't have a discussion today without, mm -hmm. um, without bringing her up. And also, it really begets this conversation mm -hmm. of how it's so important important that we are inclusive of communities of color, women of color, who their barriers are in many cases far higher and greater, mm -hmm. um, and we are here to work together. And who have so much of the answer and have so many of the ideas. Diversity isn't a nice concept, it's a practically useful fact of whether the change happens. Mm -hmm. and you have yeah, hi, my name's Suzanne. Um, I was just trying to um, get back to the point that was made earlier about it's not illegal to be an asshole. Um, I think we need to be really careful about ignoring the fact that bullying behavior actually is, I think, what puts a lot of um, pressure on people to be quiet, to remain quiet, to not talk about the things that they care about, which then includes this kind of harassment. So I think really the conversation about power has to start with how we tolerate those kinds of abuses. And that goes right to the journalism because we've all been in the meetings where people are made to feel stupid, ideas aren't listened to. There's there's patterns that we have. Mm -hmm. And I've worked at the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, I've worked at NPR, I've worked at CIR. The reality is those kinds of patterns are actually maybe our biggest issue mm -hmm. because they lead to the silence. Mm -hmm. And the silence is the thing that kind of gets us in trouble. And there, I think I might be having to speak up that there are female and male bullies. Mm -hmm. And I think it's good that we're thinking of ourselves as allies across um, this group here. But it's really important that we do um, have real mentorship programs in our newsrooms where people can feel safe. 
and it, 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 I think it goes beyond sexes. But to me, I'm really hoping that as we go into the second part of the conversation, that, that we don't separate those two things, that the bullying really is a central part of this industry. Good point. Thank you. Go ahead. I want to touch on the, the silencing mechanism, and a lot of our network is really concerned, especially freelancers, about speaking up in any context. And so there are two things I want to, I would ask you and everybody in the room. One is um, these whisper networks and the fact that women rely on them. And if you're lucky enough to be part of the network, then you will hear about these bad apples, but if you're not, you won't. And also anonymous reporting. Um, and different systems that are being conceptualized right now. An, an app is being considered about reporting anonymously to your organization. So I just wonder like, how you get beyond, obviously for reporting you have different standards, but just for reporting within an organization, how do you, where there is no trust, offer up a system where you can start to move in the right direction? I had a uh, reaction to that list, the shitty men of media. And I had two reactions, actually. One is, man, that is outrageous that a bunch of anonymous people could assemble a list, uh, a bunch of guys, um, and accuse them of various things with no accountability whatsoever. And my second reaction was, boy, that's really interesting. And it might be worth looking into these things and um, proving out one thing or another uh, about those people on that list. So back to your whisper networks. Um, I don't know that was a whisper. It was. Well, that was not a whisper. Yeah, that was not a whisper. <laughs> but you know, the the word has to. You know, it's you have to get the word out. You have to warn each other. You have to talk amongst yourself. You don't have any choice. One thing I have never shared that kills me, is that I wasn't part of the whisper network. I was a sort of geeky solo with some friends, but they weren't the ones who knew. And so when we came together as a group, and the cases against Mark Halperin that are verified range from the 90s to 2006, that meant, whew, effectively, I was served up to him. They served us up generation after generation. The system, whether whoever you want to blame for it. And so it not passing on meant that we were, he was given, being given a command over young women when some knew here and some didn't know there. Now, you know me well enough to know I left television reporting to go into product design. And so this is a design challenge. It's not hard. It's very easy. That was a very rudimentary prototype. You can actually design systems where once there is critical mass, there's a level of visibility. And once there is visibility, it can be reported. And that, that's not hard. It's actually uh, three hours at a whiteboard and some people. Okay, let's talk. <laughs> OK. We are out of time, but we I want to say that we have so much to talk about based on this conversation and the next conversation. And I want to thank the incredible hard work of the reporters on this panel and the courage of Laura and her fellow women and others who have stepped up. And thank you so much for participating and for your work ahead. Thank you. Thank you.